disagree with uh, the energy you should come from. I think most of us would recognize that if possible we would like to be in control of our own destiny and generate our own energy. CNR hold five conditional licenses. They're not operational licenses at this stage, they're conditional licenses. And you've got to go through the process of deconditionalizing them over the next few years, including, as you've said, dealing with the plan. Two of those are in Wales, one is here in South Wales in the Lacker Estuary, the second one is in the D Estuary, two of them are in Scotland, and one of them is in England, and we've got a sixth application awaiting determination in England. And where we are at the moment, within those license areas, is undertaking feasibility studies. Because we're talking about a deep resource and it needs a lot of evaluation. We started with the mining industry, which we'll come on to, and we'll move on from there. And it may well be, some of you will remember a few years ago, Channel 4 did a program about UCG and the Swansea Bay. The company that looked at that have allowed that license to expire and they took a professional decision that it wasn't worth proceeding with in Swansea Bay. We're at the feasibility stage and eventually we will get to the stage that involves discussions with planners and other people. And it's like this process today, we're hoping today is the start of a process of engaging with you, understanding what your concerns are, and as we move forward, come back again to talk to you and tell you where we are and where we're going. Right, there are 22 license areas, licensed by the Coal Authority. <coughs> the earliest licenses were granted in 2009, and I think I'm right in saying we're the first company to undertake a series of public meetings like this. We've been up to Scotland, we've done a presentation up there, we now do this one in Wales. We don't think that the other companies have um, gone down this path. The two licenses held by CNR in Wales were granted in 2013. This follows on from what you was told you. We fully appreciate that we need planning consent, we need environmental consents, and so on. And as this process evolves, there will be certain areas identified that are too sensitive, and we will avoid those areas. So this is an evaluative process. It's not staring over the abyss. So what is underground coal gasification? It was already, I, th I thought, one stage. Perhaps I didn't need to get up, but uh, it's a conversion of coal in a seam into a combustible gas called sitting gas. And Mike is the expert on UCG itself, the process. So there are questions about the chemistry, he's an advanced. It's a myth to say that it hasn't happened before in this country because the first trial was in Durham in 1920 and there were trials in Derby and Worcester in the 1950s. And at that time, they were obviously undertaken by what was then the National Global. And they were at shallow depth. And after they were completed, they actually opened cast the coal where the UCG had taken place. The schemes were abandoned at that time because the galleries that formed the UCG channels were mined by miners. And it was far too labour intensive and uneconomic. And so the whole thing was abandoned. And whilst UCG continued around the world, in this country it came to a stop. The European community recognised that throughout Europe there were valuable coal resources left. And there were trials undertaken to exploit or see whether it could be developed at greater depth. The one that I went to, where I actually met Mike, because Mike was the director, was the El Tremador trial in Spain. And that applied to a deep coal seam, you'll see it in a minute, about 500 metres deep. And they used a new technology at that time called CREP, which I'll explain later. But this was the step change from where we came from. That's a photograph of the site in Spain. Um, 
There are cylinders on the left hand side which were to do with the oxygen to aid the ignition. But the dominant feature in there is the stack in the middle. Now this was a European funded trial. It was a scientific trial. It wasn't a company trying to make a profit. It wasn't um, sponsored by individual companies. It was a multi-country discipline. When I went out there, Mike, as I said, was director. There were people working on it from Spain and other countries. And what they wanted to do was find out, could you burn the coal? And what was coming up the stack? So there was no electricity, there were no chemicals produced. They were monitoring the stack, which you can see in the middle of what was coming out of it. But they didn't generate any electricity. Now years ago, and I, I know within this audience there are people from the coal industry who I recognize, and years ago they would know that underground we used to struggle to drill a hole in coal for 40 yards. <coughs> Technology moved on. And by the time we got to this, which was in the 1990s, the two boroughs that were on that site were 100 metres apart. And this was considered at that time a step change to drill 100 metres in coal and keep the drill string in coal. Even in this situation, it failed to stay in the coal all the way, but it was very close to the coal. <coughs> that, as I said, was the big change. And the conclusions which anybody can read, they're all on the website from that, were that the feasibility of UCG, they call it an intermediate depth. 500 meters was demonstrated. New deviated drilling techniques were successful. And at that point I'd like to read this what somebody else has said that here watching. There is no fracking needed with <coughs> an intermediate depth, the coal was readily ignitable and gasification was effective. The cavity growth appears to be enhanced with depth. And this is a feature we'll talk about again. Could, could you wait till the, till the end of the presentation? And then, if you need to know that, Mike can definitely tell you who's there. So, if you look at a simplified diagram of um, what's happening. You have the injection well, as you told you earlier. The injection well is drilled vertically and then follows the pole seam. You drill a separate bore and those two intersect. You use a, you know, um, electric, electricity cables on a surface, you see them on these big wooden properties. But there was equivalent to one of those on the surface there with a coil tube on it. That coil tube fed down to the bottom of the production well. The coal was ignited at that point and slowly this tube was retracted. And as it retracted, obviously you see a bit of void, which is shown there. Now, in the trial in Spain, they had that channel, as they call it, for roughly 100 metres in length. But the width of the channel was only about 10 metres. And, and the reason for that is, the analogy I used when I talked about Scotland, it's not like setting fire and it will run away with you. At the end of the day, it's just like when you go out into the garden with a horse pipe. The only point in the pole scene is the end of the borehole. And there is oxygen coming out at the end of the borehole, which starts the ignition. But as you retract it, just like using a horse pipe, it won't go indefinitely to the left or to the right. It can only retract along the line of the borehole. And so you only end up with combustion, in the case of the Spanish trial, 10 metres wide. And the greatest ambition we've got at the moment, anybody with UCG, is that you end up with a channel 30 metres wide. 